Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Zach Wingard of Wingard Wearables, a company out of Pennsylvania making some very interesting tomahawks, spears, and other unique weapons intended for EDC. You heard that right, tomahawks for comfortable, everyday concealed carry. And he and his product videos make a very compelling case. So compelling that I recently bought a Wingard Wearables Empress Tomahawk. Zach's take on the spontoon hawk of Northeastern Woodland Native American warriors. Now I've yet to successfully carry it concealed out and about, except for early morning walks with the dog, but I'm still new to the EDC Tomahawk concept which I plan to change this very same day. But before we dig in, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, our live stream, and the other great interviews with makers and personalities that make the knife world happen. If you wanna support the show and enjoy exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing this. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So as I said in the beginning, tomahawks, EDC tomahawks, not too many people out there even endeavoring to make that a reality. And uh, of course, we're going to talk all about that. But but before we get to that, tell me about your fascination with tomahawks and and uh, you know why you think they're such effective, uh, you know, close combat weapons. Um, so my fascination with weapons started just as a kid, you know, I would doodle everything from blades to hand grenades. Um, but, you know, as a kid, I think it was 1993, uh, Last of the Moicans came out on VHS and my parents let me watch that. They were good parents. They would fast forward through like the, the makeout scene between Daniel Day-Lewis and Cora. But, you know, I got to see Magua and you know, the heart rippings and everything. And yeah, that probably had an effect on my young nine-year-old brain, uh, probably had Tom Ox on the brain ever since. Um, but, you know, when I got, uh, you know, moved out of Alabama and moved up uh, north to Pennsylvania, there were awful lot of areas where I couldn't carry uh, a handgun. Um, and there were even a lot of knife uh, length restrictions and there was nothing explicit about tomahawks. You know, when a lot of these weapon laws were passed back in the day, you know, in the mid 1800s, tomahawks had long been off the scene for, you know, crimes and that sort of thing. So um, I started thinking about, you know, how do I make something that has common lawful purpose, like a, a light hatchet and make that ergonomic for everyday carry? Um, as close combat weapons, I mean, you got, you know, maximum uh, lethality at maximum reach. Um, and yeah, they're instantly incapacitating if you hit the person in the right place. Uh, knives are great. I love knives. I carry knives all my life. Uh, you know, thrust-based, uh, you know, combat is a time game. It can take an eternity. Even if you uh, stick the blade in the heart, the most lethal wound you can do on somebody can still take many, many seconds for the person to become incapacitated versus, you know, a chop to the head, which is just instant even if the person survives they're just instantly lights out so you're saying like basically someone could still have some fight left in them um otherwise uh you know if you if you stick it in the heart or something like that they could still fight back and do oh, yeah. lethal damage to you but Absolutely. but the tomahawk or, or some sort of uh weapon and you and you you mentioned how it has distance like maximum lethality but also maximum distance it gives you some standoff range yeah, I mean, it's you, you got the tomahawk head at maximum length, and that's where all the lethality is concentrated. And it's because you can target the skull, the brain, the central nervous system reliably. Um, 
it opens up all the target sets. You know, with knives, you're mostly limited to targeting fleshy areas. There's some specialty knives. If you go to like medieval times, it could punch through anything. Um, but most EDC knives today, um, you're targeting major blood vessels or trying to cut nerves, that sort of thing. And there's just been so many terrible things you could see in the news uh, where people got stuck, uh, died later, but they were certainly capable of uh, fighting uh, even after the lethal injury was uh, put in. But I've never seen any account of anyone getting hit with a hatchet in the head and not falling down instantly. Um, so that's just, that's physics, you know, that's that's uh, your anatomy. So Tom Hawk's really open it all up. So in these days, uh, especially with um, people who do videos online like I do about knives and such, I I'm very open about my fascination with weapons. I'm very open about, um, you know, I've done uh, quite a bit of martial arts training with weapons. Uh, and um, to me, that's a major, major factor in my fascination with this. I, like you, have been fascinated uh, since I was a kid, you know, a yeah. very young kid with all this stuff. But um, have you received any pushback? You know, because your stuff is very obviously um, combative in nature. Is Do you have people pushing back on that? Uh, I'm sure there are some. Um, you know, for the most part, though, it's about having as much capability as possible. Like, you can carry one tool on you, this, it weighs about the same as your smartphone, and yet it's capable of utility cuts, uh, a gardening tool, um, lots of common lawful purpose, but it's also an instantly incapacitating weapon. And so our company is, isn't just about tomahawks, we're about other tools, but it's about each one of those tools being as light, as easy to carry as possible, and having a whole range of capability from common utility to you know, combative self-defense. Um, the Empress Tomahawk is definitely the most optimized as a weapon. It's kind of mm -hmm. like the Sykes Fairband dagger of Tomahawks. Uh, but our other Tomahawk, you know, the, the Back Ripper and some of the other ones that we have in the works definitely have bushcraft and common utility cuts. I open boxes every day. You know, if I got to cut a bunch of weeds to cut a path through, a, you know, a garden, it works as a sickle. So they always should have common lawful purpose. The Empress, you definitely can do some utility cuts with it, but it is more optimized, more purpose driven. Well, actually, let's talk about the Empress because I was very taken in with this. Uh, you you did a series of videos um, that you posted to Instagram a few weeks back, uh, where I guess you had a bunch of turkeys that had turned, you know, a bunch of uh, um, already dead for food turkeys, not yeah. like you were running around the field. Uh, but but you wanted to demonstrate the the efficacy of these and some of your other implements on those turkeys. And and I fell in love with this. I mean, I had seen pictures of it, but seeing it in motion and frankly, uh, hearing your pitch and, and seeing what how they how they worked really uh, got got uh, got under my skin. And so I reached out to you and, and got this thing. And I, I love it. It, it kind of comes around with me all, all over the house. It, it's it it's taken the um the the grand position of bedside table you know oh, like it, that's awesome yeah it, it comes around with me quite a bit um tell me a little bit about the um inspiration for the design of this uh, you, you have very specific inspiration for this well there are specific motifs on it. it's got shark like motifs but the uh, inspiration was a uh, stone headed war club i should have had one of these out there they're kind of football shaped uh, they have a, a football-shaped rock with rawhide connected to a stick. And sometimes they're called by collectors skull crushers. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the inspiration behind that was to ease the extraction of a tomahawk blade. And I started with conical football shapes, and they were just too wide for carry. So we wound up flattening them. And then I went through a whole design process going through flattened shapes, 3D printing different shapes mm -hmm. um, and even pressing them in like styrofoam to see, you know, as a, you know, it's plastic, so it's not got cut, but pressing through styrofoam to see what different blade geometries got more stuck versus extracted more easily. And so the shape of your uh, Empress Tomahawk today um, is based on that. And it also happens to have, you know, shark-like aesthetics to it. So it's flat on one side, rounded on the other. Um, like a megalodon tooth and it's kind of mm -hmm. shaped like a, a shark tooth or a shark head and we went with that shark motif for the rest of the handle 
Um, so it's just, you know, a combination of form and function being targeted at the same time. And it came together very well. Yeah. It, it, uh, um, uh, oh, and so some of this now you've, it's got, uh, like your back ripper tomahawk, it has this back sort of talon shaped, um, uh, spike. This is inspired by what the, the spiked tomahawks of the Northeastern woodlands is this yeah so they had a wide variety of spike tomahawk shapes because they were all uh almost all of them were hand forged individually on the frontier they weren't made overseas and shipped like other tomahawk designs so you get this huge diversity of spike tomahawk designs and so many of them were curved like very curved to the point where you could not percussively penetrate with the spike and so uh, you know the their history was an oral history the warriors of the eastern woodlands that you know their specific combative techniques are gone, but you can look at the designs that they favored, how light they were, um, and why certain design features were there. Uh, and you can speculate when you get a realistic, um, you know, reproduction in your hands, how they might have used them. And I found that curved spikes were very efficient in combatives. Um, you don't use them percussively, you use them like a meat hook on a stick. Um, so you can catch and uh, grab like, you know, the back of the knee joint, or if someone's mm -hmm. inside your lethal arc, you can sort of do a wrap and rip. Um, very few of their spikes had sharpened inside edges. Almost none of them did. We added that yeah. um, to increase the utility. And I mean, the back ripper, this is a great little garden sickle. We have customers use it for gardening uh, as well. Uh, we've got a guy uh, out in California. He's a beekeeper too, but he's handicapped. He's uh, paralyzed, uh, so he uses this like an extended reach hook hand and gardening tool just to catch and drag various objects. You know, it, is, it doesn't have to all be about the weapon, right. um, but we definitely optimize it for that. And then you figure out how many adjacent possibilities there are to make it as practical as possible. Uh, when I got this and when I started wa you know, watching your videos and, and looking at the designs, this and the back ripper, this, uh, I immediately, you know, my mind went to the combatives aspect first. And this reminded me of, um, there's a French fighting system called Lacan and where, where they use canes and do a lot of hooking and trapping and tripping. And, you know, it's the same sort of thing, you know, grab behind someone's neck and pull them into your knee. Now this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that because you you might. <laughs> oh, that would not knee. be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'd be but, bad news for him. Yeah. But it, but it has a lot of the trapping and manipulating um, uh, sort of possibilities to it. Definitely. So I've handed this to a, a number of people, my wife, uh, some friends from work um, and uh, some friends from around around the neighborhood who they all have a, a similar reaction when they pick it up. But after they get over the whoa effect, it's this is so light. Yes, it's got to be. Yeah. So uh, tell me a little bit about th your philosophy on uh, the weight of tomahawks. I have, and, and before we get to that, I just want to say I have, th this was um, my uh, cold steel yes. uh, Nordic hawk. I, I love cold steel. You know, I'm a big oh, fan yeah. boy. And um, I have, this is my only tomahawk by them, regrettably, because I have some cool ones, but it is noticeably, noticeably heavier than than uh, than the Empress. And you see, it even makes noise when I put it down. So I, I'd like to know your philosophy of, behind the weight of tomahawks and then also how you go about getting such a lightweight implement with, I mean, this is bronze on top and wood mm -hmm. on the bottom, and yet it's lighter than many of my folding knives. H how do you make that happen? Uh, well, we purposely designed for that, and that goes back to those historic spike tomahawk designs. Uh, spike tomahawks historically weighed, on average, 8 to 12 ounces total, head and handle. Hmm. And you look at, when I first started investigating uh, everyday carry tomahawks in 2016, I looked at the market, and everything was mostly north of 20 ounces uh, that wow. was on the market. So I was like, wow, that's a huge gap in weight. And so everything we do is kind of based on capability gaps. Like I want to be able to everyday carry a Tomahawk, for instance, uh, because of the capabilities and combatives and utility. Well, it's gotta be easy to carry. And uh, I started, I, I love cold steel as well. I started with cold steel Tomahawks, did a lot of aggressive chop and mods because they were so cheap. You know, you could afford, you know, Dremel tool cutoffs and grinding wheels, just hours and hours of work. And I started dropping the weight to 12 ounces to 10 ounces, to eight ounces. 
Um, and you just saw how the tomahawk completely changed on its behavior. It eventually, once you got below 12 ounces, that's when it got fast. And when it got to like eight ounces, it is lightning fast. It's like throwing a punch. Like there's no over the arm, over the shoulder, exaggerated wind up required. It's literally like throwing a punch and you, except you have a tomahawk at the end of your fist. Um, and I did lots of tests on like skull surrogates and other things uh, to dial in, you know, what blade width you needed with a lighter tomahawk. And that eventually led to our uh, back ripper tomahawk design. But even with all those mods, and they were, it was a lot of work, um, none of them were ergonomic for carry. And so even though you could get the weight down to where they were really fast and nimble, um, and that's a huge part of making something easy to carry and, and fast to fight with. Um, none of them were ergonomic. And that's when we realized, okay, we need to actually design our own Tomahawk heads. And it started as, you know, a project for myself. I wanted to conceal carry Tomahawks. But when we started working with blacksmiths and getting the prototypes made, they started to look so good that my life partner and business partner, my wife, uh, you know, we came to an agreement that like, hey, there's something to this. Other people will probably want this capability too. And yeah. so that is what started our business. Even though Tomahawk started it, we've since expanded to other things. But yeah. but yeah, that's why Tomahawks are so light. Historically, they had to be speed kills in combatives. Um, yeah. So we designed them that way. It reminds me of, uh, you know, um, I used to have a fascination with battle axes, you know, the big giant double headed, uh, you know, uh, the Boris Vallejo style battle axes, you know, from those fantasy pictures and stuff. Uh, but in doing reading, you know, the, the recovery, once you make a swing with a battle axe, first of all, it helps to be immense, you know, which I'm not, but, <laughs> but, uh, the recovery, once you swing one of those heavy weapons is, is much more time and much more space, right? You, when mm -hmm. you commit to a swing with a giant ax, you're, you're, you're committed and there's okay. very little changing midstream. And that's why, um, you know, when, when you have, I don't know if you've ever heard like a battle axe versus sword argument, it's kind of a nerdy argument, but let's yep. say I've had it before. Uh, the sword, you know, is weighted with the pommel in the back so that you can move the blade around the tip of the, around very quickly and recover from, from swings and such. And that's what this, this to me, just in casually swinging it around reminds me more of the feel of a sword in a way, because I'm used to these big giant heavy hafted and then heavy headed uh, axes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that helps a lot is having a spike on the end of your ax, because when you swing uh, and chop, if you miss because they're outside, you can instantly transition to spike side. And that's why um, I am, all our tomahawks so far have been spiked tomahawks. It really, I find that if you lose the spike, you wind up neutering uh, the tomahawks combative capability for those quick transitions mm -hmm. um, and you lose a lot of practical utility. There's like lots of people that will automatically assume a hammer pull tomahawk will be just more useful as a spike tomahawk than a spike tomahawk. And if you do the spike tomahawk right, and if the sides of the cheeks are flat, those will act as a hammer face, not for driving nails, but for like driving stakes right. and combatives, that sort of thing. So really spike tomahawk is just, uh, I'm not going to be a slave to my words and say we'll never make a non spike tomahawk, but boy, they are effective. Uh, they are very efficient tools and weapons. So you just held up your back ripper and we saw it in this angle. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the development of the ergonomics of these of these. And and also, might we uh, might we introduce your spear as well? Yes. Oh, you're talking about the micro pike? Yes, the micro yes. pike. Yeah, we can do that. So. Um, this is the first, so our design process always starts with uh, hand drawings, like lots and lots of hand drawings. Um, and then my wife gives input on the hand drawings, like, okay, I like this, the aesthetics of this, like all the drawings are function based, but mm -hmm. we always incorporate looks into them. And so, so she'll pick out a few and we'll dig deeper on it and then it'll get refined and 3D printed. And so this was the first 3D printing of a back ripper tomahawk uh, design. And you'll notice the spike was straight back. Mm -hmm. So when I put that on a wooden handle and stuck it inside my waistband, I quickly discovered that that projected off the curvature of your body, just about three quarters of an inch. And that was enough to make it miserable to carry. 
uh, especially if you sit down in a modern butt cupping car seat, you really do need that spike to follow the contour of your body uh, for it to be comfortable and streamlined or else just sitting down, which is a lot of what we do in modern day society. Um, they didn't do that a lot back then. You know, in my like 18th century, there wasn't, you didn't have office furniture. It was mostly people squatting or lying down on the ground if they weren't standing all the time. Um, but, you know, in our modern age, you've got to adapt these uh, historically proven, battle proven tools to be streamlined to your body. And so that's where that curve came from. And again, since these curved spikes aren't for percussion, but they're, you know, a meat hook drag uh, type effect, you know, that curve following the contour of your body no difference, no impact on its combative or utility capability. So I know from your videos that you carry yours, your back ripper tomahawk all the time. It's your EDC. Yes. It is your everyday carry uh, tool and weapon and and just, you know, round the house implement. How do you carry it? Uh, I, I understand the, the ergonomics of it, but how do you carry it and how do you not stab yourself? All right. Well, I have a carry system, uh, but even when you carry it naked, I, I have most I've ever done is like surface nicks when I carry uh, the Tomahawk naked. And I always start with our Tomahawk prototypes carrying it naked without any carry system because that helps us prototype the carry systems. Mm -hmm. But I carry it uh, strong side, uh, like 3 o'clock, 3.30 position inside the waistband. Whether or not I'm wearing pants, shorts, or just boxer briefs, the handle is just tucked down there. And the carry system has these strong clamps that clip to it. Right. There are some customers that have rigged shoulder holsters. Uh, using paracord wrapped around and they'll clip it to that. Um, other customers carry that, that, that are skinnier than me carry appendix carry, like mm -hmm. tuck it in their gym shorts. Um, and appendix carry is like they prefer that because they can access it with either hand and it's comfortable for them. Uh, all right. Uh, did we lose you? Oh, yeah, no, we're no, we're still good. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I carry mine. And uh, if I carry two tomahawks on me, I'll do one underarm. So I'll rig up paracord and have one or clipped inside a jacket if it's in the winter. Uh, I, I've, uh, there's a gentleman on Instagram who, um, his name escapes me now, but he specializes in archery stuff. And he's created a beautiful leather <laughs> carry yeah. system. Uh, Bradley uh, Thompson, yeah. yeah. He did one, a really good job on that. One yeah. side has a knife, one side carries his empress. <laughs> uh, I'm, on, I'm on his books for once he's done researching it to get one uh, because yeah. it, it's just he, too cool to pass up. He shared that with me on a video I told, and he was like, I don't know if I should post this. I said, definitely post it, but just know people will be asking for that. Yeah. It's yeah. like, we don't have leather skills. Like there's only so much you can do yeah. and we have not done leather skills. And so uh, people love uh, well done leather carry systems, oh, you know? Yeah. So he did a really good job on that. So let me show this off. This is, this is my Empress Tomahawk with the carry system. And uh, it's got these two great little Kydex covers for, for both blades. And then this deck cord here is flexible. And you have these alligator clips on the end that, that clip onto the, um, the inside of your pants or whatever, uh, the, the seam of your pants. And you can push off and pull and, and extract it. Now, I haven't done too much practicing uh, with it, um, but... It's conceptually, I get it. It's a matter of practice, you know, oh, yeah. over and over. Uh, but also, I, I think I'm leaning just more towards that that shoulder carry. It seems more intuitive to me. It is a um, little faster, too. You can get it under sub one second draw. You know, with practice, if you clear the covering garment, you just grab it and pull forward and it just comes out. So uh, we did a YouTube like post on little tips on that, how to get it out that quick. But the reason I don't do shoulder carry all the time is... A lot of times I just, I'm around the house in boxer briefs. Like two days ago, it was almost 90 degrees. It was miserable. We didn't want the air conditioning on. We had windows open. I'm in my boxer briefs. It's like, I don't want to wear, you know, some paracord shoulder carry rig, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was just tucked in the boxer briefs because it's more uh, reliable location across all contexts. Like even um, the Empress, I carry that in swimming trunks when I go swimming. Um, because, hey, you never know what could happen on the yeah. ocean, right? Right. Uh, you know, shark or something. I mean, that that sucker will swing fast even underwater. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's to me, the inside the waistband is what we started with as a carry concept. It is the most reliable, but it's been great to see customers adapting it for their contacts. We even had, you know, even though we designed these for civilian contacts, we had, uh, you know, members in the military operator types 
uh, request modifications to make them Molly compatible so that, mm. you know, they can slide like a, this is a, an Empress Tomahawk that has a skinnied up shorter handle to slide through the Molly pals loops on their play oh, carrier. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, if they do room clearing thing and get tangled up, they can access something more potent than a knife. You know, if one of their buddies gets in a tangle, you know, you can use the hook to peel a person off of another. Um, I haven't heard of anyone having to do that yet. These were kind of recent, uh, you know, iterations on our product lines, but they're popular. So, uh, you know, now we're, we're selling more Molly back rippers than we are full size back rippers because, hmm. um, you know, the compactness and, uh, the ability of putting it through Molly palace loops. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you make these things. Uh, you have, this is cast high silicone bronze. Is that right? High, high strength silicone bronze. High and, and the back ripper has a tool steel, right? Yes. Okay. So how, how are these made? Uh, I have a very, uh, I, the back ripper is, um, made by a blacksmith. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then this, yeah. Tell, that is tell a us foundry. How these... So, oh. uh, we work with five or six, I think it's six small businesses. Now, uh, we do not do everything ourselves or else we would get hardly anything made. Mm -hmm. uh, I am not a blacksmith. I work with two blacksmiths. One's in Delaware. The other is in uh, North Carolina. And so, uh, the one in Delaware, hand forges our micro pikes and our quills. Um, so our thrust based uh, weapons and the blacksmith in Hillsboro hand forges our back ripper tomahawk heads. Um, the Empress is cast bronze. And actually here's a, you can really see that bronze pop here. This is like, I purposely wore yeah. off the patina on this one. Um, just to, you know, it's my own personal version. I just wanted to see how it looked, you know, with aesthetics, but uh, there's a foundry we work with out in Lancaster PA. Um, and we initially had the Empress Tomahawks hand forged out of, of uh, tool steel. And the hand forging process was just so variable. Uh, the Empress Tomahawk is really, um, it's three complex surfaces that intersect to create this simple, clean look, you know, this clean arc. Mm -hmm. And hand forging, um, it was like three attempts of hand forging. One of them would be up to aesthetic you know, quality. And so we knew given the application was flesh and bone, it's a spontoon tomahawk. It's not like a breaching tomahawk or a wood chopping tomahawk. We knew that bronze would be plenty strong for that application. Right. Uh, we were also getting requests for like a rust proof version too. Um, and you know, bronze can't rust and it's beautiful. Um, so we went with, uh, bronze. Um, so those get sand casted. Um, you know, you have belt sander to take off the sand casting marks and give it a uniform appearance. Um, and we patina those, you know, in our backyard out here, um, you know, put a little wax coating on it to keep the patina, you know, a little bit of uh, wear resistance. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the Empress Tomahawk heads are made. All the hickory comes from Pennsylvania. Um, our initial prototypes are all hand sawed. Uh, you know, I use a draw knife and a rasp to make, to prove out the handles. Um, but then, um, we do get the hickory CNC machine close to the final shape. Oh. Um, and then that saves us time. It's still a lot of time to hang these heads. Um, these aren't your standard drop through the top friction fit Tomahawk heads. Um, those are favored because they're cheap and take a little effort to assemble them. But there are a lot of disadvantages with that uh, approach, both for safety, uh, mainly for safety and also for performance. Um, so we hang our uh, tomahawks wedged like the historic spike tomahawks were done. So you can have a, a fatter handle for grip retention um, and also have other complex features on it, like pointed pommels, that sort of thing. And so the, the hickory used in the handles, we also use hickory for the wedges from the same tree. So there's no mismatch. Like you don't, you never use metal wedges on a tomahawk because there'll always be a mismatch as wood, you know, is exposed to different uh, humidity in the air and, and the metal shrinks at cold temperatures and expands in hot temperatures. Like metal wedges are only appropriate for a tool that's hanging in your tool shed. You can, you know, if it gets a little loose, okay, you got vice right there to fix it. Right. It should never be in a weapon that you carry out in the field that you got to rely on or else you're going to have a loose head eventually. 
So anyway, that's sorry to ramble there on what no, 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 I nerd out on that. Sort of yeah, stuff. yeah. Well, I can nerd out on it too. <laughs> so you held up a, a quill just there and a um, micro pike. Tell us about these. Okay, so the micro pike um, is. It's one of these things that like everyone gets a tomahawk and even when you have unique tomahawk elements they still understand what a tomahawk can do when people see the micro pike they don't understand it um even on instagram if you and that's one of the barriers for social media is no one can handle anything they have to be in person really and then they hold it and they understand like all its capability but the micro pike came about when i saw a picture of uh, the oss time dagger i'm not not sure if everyone's familiar with that but you know back in world war ii um, because of resource scarcity, the OSS wanted a thrust based like stabbing tool and they were just chopping, uh, pitchfork tines and wrapping them in some leather and it had a curve. And I looked at that and I thought that kind of reminds me of the curve of the contour of a person's waistline. It wasn't the same, but it inspired me. Um, and I'm a big fan of all kinds of historic military weapons. So really the, um, the micro pike is like a leaf blade on a streamlined handle that's curved to follow the contour of your body. And we have a thumb pad that was inspired by the uh, V42 stiletto yeah. um, and a double-edged leaf blade because I mean, that's as battle proven as you can get. I mean, back in the bronze age, they were stabbing people with leaf bladed spears. So it is essentially a spear that goes and curves to conform to your waistline. And it really has to be hand forged. Like a lot of our designs, like people think blacksmithing is like, Oh, it's just an old school artisan thing. Um, in many ways with our designs, because they're ergonomic driven and, and so much about ergonomics is curves, it's far more economically efficient to move the metal than remove the metal. So you can make this from stock removal. It would cost you a fortune, right? It's much better for the blacksmith to start with bar stock and then move the metal and form it into the complex shape, um, both from time and economic efficiency. Like having that skilled hand forged item, that, that talented blacksmith, he more efficiently makes that than if you were to try to do that on stock removal. Same right. with the and quill. You, you and know, with stock that, removal, you'd be removing so much steel to get that oh, curve. Yeah. It, it wouldn't oh, make it any cost sense. So, yeah, it wouldn't make any sense. And that's, and that's where, you know, you get people stuck in the stock removal mindset because that's what they know. Um, a lot of the tomahawks they make, not to criticize them, but a lot of them are full tang and result in uh, really high tomahawk weights um, because you want it's tough to to take a flat piece of metal and connect it to a piece of wood you know you need to drift an eye and that sort of thing but if you're in that stock removal world you make it from a sheet of metal you put handle scales on it yeah. and that does result in increased weight it's still a very capable tool a high amount of talent being done on that but so far we have stayed away from that because again weight is everything um, you want it crazy lightweight this is under eight ounces. That's even lighter than your Empress. Empress is, is it the really? heaviest tomahawk we make. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm not me? kidding you. Wow. I'm not. I'm so that uh, one, the back rippers are even longer, but slightly lighter. Yeah. Yeah. I think that yeah. might be that, that might be next time. <laughs> this is starting to feel really Oops. heavy, man. Really heavy. Yeah, I, think I, know. I need a back uh, ripper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we may make a heavier tomahawk. I think uh, some of the products uh, that we're looking at down the road will be a touch heavier, but we'll try to keep it under uh, 12 ounces. So. The uh, well, I want to get to the stingray at some point, but mm -hmm. before we do, uh, let's talk about the quill. This is a fascinating thing, and tell me about uh, the origin of this. Um, so in February 2019, uh, the wife and I were on vacation away from day job, away from small business, so we could just clear our heads and, and, and think, free up our thinking. And uh, the wife and I were driving, and uh, she noted that most women's self defense tools were clearly designed by men. And so think pink handguns, pink knives, um, or they were tools that just didn't do anything for you for self-defense. Like there's this GPS that you can drop off after you've been raped and killed and they can find your body. That's like what they pitch to women for self-defense. So it's like, right. all right, what can we do that is streamlined to a woman's body? In most self-defense situations for a woman, the, the, uh, uh, her threat, his intention is to get very close to her. So for her to be able to rapidly access something that's very difficult for the man to disarm and also very unpleasant to be on the receiving end, you know, we had that, we had that capability gap there. And so uh, my wife thought, why can't we make something that goes tucks behind the ear? Um, 
And so I'll, I'll try to tuck that behind the ear there and not dislodge the microphone. But uh, that was the initial inspiration. And that's why it has this curled shape um, that is kind of reminiscent of like the golden spiral, like Fibonacci spiral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, when we start prototyping that, um, so that was her concept when we started designing it. We found that just curling a round stock like wire or thick round stock, something cylindrical, uh, was just terrible. Um, it would slip around in the hand. Um, it, it was an unstable grip. And so we eventually discovered as we were iterating on the uh, cross sections that the diamond cross section, kind of like a medieval bodkin arrowhead point, mm. that was the best. It reduced the weight. It increased the, the uh, stiffness and also the tiny muscles in your hand. When you make that fist around the quill, despite all these different you know, grip options that you have, those tiny muscles will mate up against, press up against those diamond facets and just lock it in. And it is not a tool that you could disarm. I mean, it's just it, all, the, all the opponent has to work with to disarm this from you is a tiny diamond shaped spike that is hurting him. You know, <laughs> so it's like you have all the power on, dis, on, on holding, controlling your weapon and they do not. It's, it's, yeah. And this was, again, it was driven by self-defense, but it's wonderful how many practical ways this has been used. I mean, these things weigh like the slum quills weigh an ounce, the, the original quills weigh under two ounces, but you know, customers send us videos like, Hey, this is the new way I figured out how to open my beer with a quill or, you know, <laughs> I had this chocolate bar and I had to you know, split it up with my girlfriend, but there weren't any score marks. I just, you know, you know, use the quill for that. It's like, and I use mine every day. Um, so it's, again, it's about maximizing your capability. Something that weighs very little is easy to wear and you can use it both as a weapon of self-defense and for many common practical utility purposes. And that's just where we want to be as a company. Uh, with a simple, unique, clean look. We, you know, I'm not going to be a slave to my words, but we try to avoid things that have already been addressed on the market. We want unique designs, uh, unique capabilities. That does mean we swim upstream. Like, I'm trying to think of who else is attempting to do everyday carry tomahawks. That's not, like, people talk about the knife industry being niche. If you have a pie graph of the knife industry, what's the little slice of pie for everyday carry tomahawks? It's yeah. almost non-existent. Right. We kind of had to create that demand. So you're swimming against the current. Um, and so that means things start slow, but it's just one of those ideas that you can't look away from. You can't ignore. Um, I mean, just all that capability. And so, uh, yeah, that's sorry to ramble off topic, but that's where we like to be as a company is designing things that are very distinctive and capable. Uh, I appreciate the lack of squeamishness you and and uh, your company in general has in addressing um, self defense because I, I can't help it. I, I live in a very um, uh, in a very what do I want to say domesticated and affluent suburb, mm -hmm. and yet I, I cannot help but see like a, a an appalling rise in crime around us. I mean, like oh, yeah. horrific things happening like close to where I live on the regular yeah. uh, i have a uh, you know a police friend who was filling me in on that and all you got to do is uh, look in the paper um so there really is a need for stuff like this and not everyone is willing to carry a, a pistol not e not everyone can mm -hmm. not every jurisdiction allows it um so i think even having something like the quill which uh, you know uh, requires a you know quite a close situation to to use but i mean this kind of thinking, at least you, know, you don't have to be thinking about it all the time like I do or like you do, because we find fascination in it. But, you know, this this does have to be something that people consider the defense of themselves. And then if they have children, they are responsible for children, too, mm -hmm. and protecting them. Oh, and absolutely. sometimes that requires to go mama bear or papa bear on someone. And, Good to uh, have claws in your hand for that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I really appreciate uh um, companies, outfits, makers like yourself who address it directly and, and who aren't uh, giving a million caveats about how, oh, this is just a tool, just a tool. You know, a hammer is just a tool too, but a lot of crimes are committed with hammers. Yep. Uh, speaking of hammers, and, and uh, actually you had a, you have a prototype on your table of, of the Stingray Tomahawk. And I have a fascination with, it's not here, I have a cold steel war hammer. I also love war hammers. 
tell me about what you're working on. T tell me about the Stingray. And then also I'm going to beseech you to, to, to come up with a Warhammer someday. <laughs> actually, actually uh, we had a Warhammer concept sketched out and COVID kind of delayed it. Um, oh, okay. We're, we're, I'll, I'll get into that now, I guess. So one of the things we like to do on Instagram is like little competitions. Like for instance, the Stingray, we didn't have a name for that. Even though it looks like a Stingray, we held like a naming contest, did it like an NCAA March Madness bracket. You know, so people could suggest names or vote on them. But we did try to do a collaborative design uh, EDC Warhammer. And that got to, um, let's see. I mean, we, we sketched it out, got people's ideas and input. And it was at the stage where we would get it 3D printed when COVID got scarier um, mm -hmm. and the demand clicked up. Like we thought when we were going to do, oh, let's do a Warhammer because people will stop ordering stuff because like, they're stuck at home and, you know, they can't work, that sort of thing. And that didn't happen. Uh, we actually had a big uptick in demand. Um, and I don't know how much of that was just as a company, our presence growing, or just all the scary stuff people were seeing on their smartphones. It felt like we were in a zombie movie and they were like, hey, I need zombie weapons. You know, I don't know what was, why our demand kicked up, but that's what uh, stopped us from pursuing the Warhammer and putting it on the back burner was just like, all of a sudden we're having a, a little bit of trouble keeping up. Uh, mm -hmm. But the Stingray, um, that is uh, intended to capture the combative capability of throwing tomahawks. There is a style of throwing tomahawk, the, the Iroquois, uh, you, you see repeated uh, styles of it. And it was a, a long spike, straight spike, that came to a chisel tip, and then a chopping blade that flared in both directions and was mm -hmm. lunar. It was very curved. And so this is not... Uh, a copy of a historic design. It's like we looked at a bunch of historic designs and said, okay, how could we make that for EDC? And even though this is straight and, um, you know, pushing seven inches from a spike tip to chopping edge, it does appear to carry um, underarm and appendix carry quite well. Um, so that's what the Stingray came from, was a, a desire to get that combative capability of the throwing tomahawk and then see what adjacent possibilities there were. And the prototype right now, it's undergoing a lot of changes. Like it's gonna, we're going to a much thicker eye geometry and that sort of thing. Um, but it, it seems to be a pretty capable tool. It's really good for uh, you know driving stakes. You can slam this on the ground, easily extract it, and then pound a, a wooden stake into the ground like a hammer. Plus you can mm -hmm. chop with it. Um, you can drill holes with a chisel. Um, so it, and in combatives, you can do unique grips, you know, like two handed grips for less lethal and then, you know, far deadlier moves when you're chopping. Um, but, yeah, that's the inspiration behind the stingray. The uh, that that design in particular looks uh, like it lends itself to that re that recovery backstroke you were talking about earlier. Um, you know, oh, yeah. you, you swing through with the bladed side, you miss or whatever, and then you keep. Yeah. Oh yeah, you got a four inch spike on the guy to tear him down. That'd be pretty bad for him. Um, and we pointed the pommel too. And the, the final handle design will be shaped differently. But I mean, we even went through the trigonometry of this thing spinning in flight to optimize how long the handle needed to be, um, you know, increasing the probability of this sticking in a way that, you know, an opponent wouldn't like to be hit like. And so uh, that's what got us to this size and shape. About three quarters of a, uh, it's motion. If you like, it's got like a 75% chance of hitting someone in a bad way, uh, which is pretty darn good compared to like a standard throwing hat that just has a chopping blade. Like if you lose the spike and you don't have a pointed pommel, you're losing a lot of capability in the throw. Yeah. It's like, it's like this thing. Uh, you know, I watched the cold yeah. steel videos, they pick it up they throw it every time it sticks. Of course they have the power of editing. Every time I throw it, it, bonks, yeah, it's that, I it hits this. <laughs> <laughs> wakes up yep. the whole neighborhood. Um, you mentioned that you're increasing the eye geometry on the stingray. Why? Um, so this was an originally hand forged and the eye was a little narrow and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was about a quarter inch thick instead of three eighths. It's about an inch long. And so we wanted to increase the volume of wood in the eye because it is intended for throwing. Okay. And so there's a lot of stress. And when you do a lot of testing on tomahawks, um, 
tomahawks are hung in this fashion, if the handle breaks, it always breaks under the cheeks uh, because that's where maximum stress is. So the heavier your handle is and the skinnier, your, you know, the less volume you have of wood to distribute that stress, the more stress is concentrated. So by tripling the volume inside the eye, that greatly increases the durability of the tomahawk. This is an eye geometry. This is the amount of volume of wood you, you'll see in much heavier tomahawks. Mm. And because the head is lighter, uh, we believe it will be very durable. But that's why we do a lot of testing. And so hopefully within a year, this prototype will become a product line. It's just we take a long time to do all our tests. And that's why we only put out one to two designs a year. Um, like the Empress Tomahawk, that was an idea. And three years later, it was a product line. I mean, it just takes time, you know? So well, anyway. It, it's good to know that it's gone through a lot of research and development because it's, you know, it's not, it's something you want to get right. Oh yeah. For sure. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know that you're talking about the stress on the head from, from throwing it, uh, the stress on the, where the head meets the wood. And my instant thought is, uh, I don't know how you say langer or langettes or whatever. Langettes. Yeah. Langettes. Uh, those uh, kind of plates of metal that uh, you would put on the haft to shore up this connection and and to you know um, strengthen that that connection. But it seems like that would probably add more weight than the minimal amount of material it would take to make the eye bigger. Yeah, and we may do langettes on a future design like. Two years from now, we've kind of got that road mapped out. So what Langets buy you, you see those in a lot of historic boarding axes. Um, it buys you increased strength when you chop into something and then pry. Like you never do chop and pry with a wood handled hatchet or axe or one of our tomahawks because that's, it might work once or twice, but it's going to break there. That's why, you know, your East Wig uh, hatchets and some of the more durable uh, breaching tomahawks are intended to be heavy they're full tang because they don't have a head handle connection juncture that can um that's discontinuous this metal to wood it's all metal um but boarding axes definitely weighed a lot uh and i i'll get into that in a future youtube video people think tomahawks came from boarding axes that that actually isn't the case um but yeah those langets are, are very important you see them also in trench axes like in world war one those trench axes were really common. Um, and yeah, it's good for utility uh, when weight is great. Uh, but when it comes to ease of carry and everyday carry, I mean, ounces matter big time. Uh, so if you were to do a knife, I don't, I'm not sure if you have any interest in doing knives, but what, what do you think from all of your experience with tomahawks and uh, like the micro pike? and the quill what what would you imbue a knife with what what design would you go for uh we have two knife designs i'm not going to share <laughs> uh, okay it's too too far out uh, okay. but but we do and i'm really hopeful that no one comes up with something that's like what we're doing in the meantime because this is the problem with having uh you know a small business or you're working a day job and, and doing all aspects of a small business, you only have so much bandwidth to sprint on a new product. So right. we got two unique knife designs. Um, it's tough to come up with a unique knife design. That's one of the reasons we didn't start with that is like, hey, there's just there's huge capability gap on Tomahawks. There's not a lot of capability gap in knives. Uh, so we have identified two of those and we have designs like 3D printed out of plastic uh, that we're iterating on. Um, but yeah, if it's already addressed in the market, we don't do it. Uh, you know, that's why, you know, the quill is like a spike you can carry, but it's not like most spikes that have, you know, a big ice pick grip, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so when we, when we tackle knives, we're taking our time for good reason. Um, you don't just boldly jump into the knife community uh, without doing your homework. I mean, this is, a, you know, it's a good community. It's a brutal community too. I mean, there's there's valid criticism made, um, and so we just want to make sure, uh, and that's why we aren't sharing these things now. Uh, yeah. We have a long way to go on the prototyping till we feel like we're going to be ready. But yeah, knives, they're on our roadmap. 
Yeah, I, I I can see what you mean. I mean the 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 work that you've done so far focuses so much on the uniqueness of not only the implement that you know that I'll, I'll just take the tomahawk for instance, but mm -hmm. also the micro micro pike and the quill, uh, and their and their ergonomics. You know, taking these things that are thought of as traditional historical weapons and making them ergonomic to carry today, you know, on the way we dress and the way we live today, that uh, a knife, yeah, you could see how you would, it would take a bit of research and development to, to really come up with something unique and, and yeah. And just be, if it looks different, why, you know, right. there may be very good reason why your thing is the new looking thing because it's bad. Right. Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, sometimes people right. come something, come up with something that's like, Oh, no one's done it before. It's like, well, actually someone did and they didn't bother documenting it because it was such a stupid idea, yeah, you know? So yeah. we got to really rigorously, uh, test to make sure. And most of our testing is actually not on like chopping flesh and bone or weapons. It's actually just ergonomics, ergonomics in the hand, ergonomics in the carry. Um, and so, yeah, we got really, uh, dive deep on knives, but hopefully in two years time, we'll have our first one. Um, and the second one is, uh, boy, it's going to be fun. And hopefully you can invite me back on, Oh yeah, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll show you that one. You, uh, maybe, maybe uh, after you announce it, you give us the exclusive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It might be. Uh, yeah. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. I, I hope, uh, we can, actually have a, a market presence to do that. Um, but yeah, it's like people say the knife industry is niche. To me, it's huge. It's abundant. Um, it's the tomahawk carry or the spike carry that's pretty niche. Um, and that's where we have been in so far. Um, but we are looking to grow. So you uh, get a lot of feedback from customers. You can see uh, on your Instagram page, you repost a lot of uh, stuff. Who who do you, if you could generalize, who do you think your customers are? Uh, there are different types. We have, of course, collectors that are looking for a unique item. Um, but I, I would ask somebody, most of our customers are carrying and using these. And so um, you have hunters that want a lightweight hatchet to break down mm -hmm. their deer. Uh, or you have people that work security in places that are explicitly barred from having a handgun. And that's usually bars. Um, mm -hmm. Even weapon loving Texas, if you're in an establishment with over 50% of its revenue from alcohol and you don't touch alcohol and you have a handgun permit, you can't carry a handgun. So we've got a customer who's bought three Empress Tomox because he wants the next most lethal thing he can carry if something really bad happens. Hmm. Um, and then you have bouncers that like the quill because the quill doesn't look like a weapon. And it is a very, all our weapons have less lethal capability. That's very important. Um, but you can do less lethal, painful things with this, um, you know, and the micro pike, you know, you can choke up and just, just the tip do rakes and gouges. But, um, you know, the other type of customer is like uh, customers in places that can't access handguns or can't legally uh, carry. Uh, so they're looking for the next most potent thing. Then you got customers with handguns that want the, the most potent backup weapon they can mm -hmm. get, um, which is a Tomahawk. Um, I mean, that's as historic as it gets, right? When, you're, when your gun didn't function, which back in the day happened a lot, yeah. um, you know, the Tomahawk was your primary CQC weapon. Uh, but in Europe, you know, the quill's been pretty good in Europe because, you know, you can't oh, carry yeah. even knives out there. Yeah. And you have something that looks like hand-forged jewelry. Um, but, you know, it <laughs> on your fist, you've way up the capability of a fist when you put a spike in it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's who our customers are. Uh, and we've had military types, too. And again, we never... Um, when after that market, we were, we were focused on civilian contacts. But, I mean, you have weapons that were battle proven. So the warriors in our society are like, hey, I want, I want that, uh, you know, as a backup weapon or in my civilian carrier. You have combat vets that, you know, they don't have access to firearms uh, and they use that for training as like sort of, a, you know, PTSD type therapy. Yeah. Uh, it's therapeutic for them to go through the combative motions. So our, our customer range is quite broad. I think there's an aspect to your implements 
I'll say it broadly like that, uh, that we haven't touched on. And that's uh, the psychological aspect. I mean, someone draws a tomahawk on you. You're going to reconsider, you know, what you're doing. You're going, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, the quill, for instance, you pull that out. You might not. That's that's one of those things that's felt and not seen. Oh, my mm -hmm. God. Where'd that come from? You know, yeah. I, I, I feel like there's a psychological aspect to your to your wares that that could have a great a preventative um, uh, uh, effect, kind of like the sound of the racking of a shotgun. I mean, they're mm -hmm. two, two very different things, but but it, there's there's the visual of seeing someone pulling out a tomahawk. Your mind is going through some some uh, machinations there. Like, oh my God, this guy's got a tomahawk. Tomahawk? Who carries the tomahawk? This guy must be, you know, like. Or even uh, the micro bike. If you draw, if you're street smart and someone draws something you've never seen before, you get the hell out of there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because you you do you do not take your chances on that. And it, we've had a couple of customers that have had to. Uh, and this gets back to like self defense philosophy. Like, uh, do you? draw and warn off a person sort of brandish this thing versus do you go like that it's drawn it's getting used like it's felt but not seen yeah. um and i under i respect the warning thing like nature does the majority of, of violence in nature is prevented because an animal warns another animal off uh, mm -hmm. so i understand that uh, a couple of our customers have had to use micro pike and empress as a deterrent uh, that prevented bloodshed probably um, because the person involved didn't want any part of it and yeah. got, got the hell out of there. Um, but yeah, that, that comes down to self-defense philosophy and that's, that's a personal decision for the customer. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a, a, a psychological impact. Um, I am more of the philosophy that if it's drawn, it's got, it, you only draw it when you absolutely have to, and then it's gotta be used. Yeah. And, um, I'm not gonna be a slave to my words, you know, I, if two of my customers drew it and then use that to prevent bloodshed. That is great. Um, but you know, that is a personal sort of philosophy discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, I've adopted similar philosophy to yours because I've seen the other fail in a disastrous way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so. Yeah. That, you draw some, a blade because you think the person is a strong arm robbery or something. And it turned out he had a gun. He just didn't want to use, or he had yeah. a buddy with a gun. It's yeah. like, Okay, you know, if you drew it, you should have used it and gotten out of there instead of doing flourishes and stuff, you know. Right, um, exactly. So, yeah, there's a lot of messy scenarios out there. So, how can uh, people who've been listening and watching who are fascinated, how can they get in touch with you? How can they get their own Empress Tomahawk? Or uh, we have Empress Tomahawks in stock on our website, oh, wingardwearables.com. We also have trainers. This is a biggie for Tomahawks. Most Tomahawk trainers are grossly lighter in weight than the live blades. Ours are within the ounce of the live blades. So if you're into combatives, uh, Volpe's training was who we partnered with to make those trainers. He did an excellent job. So we do have uh, trainers as well. But yeah, you go to Wingard Wearables. Um, we also are, are, have a pretty good presence on Instagram and a real amateur presence on YouTube, uh, but it's slowly getting better. Um, so I think one of our videos is just intolerable on the sound quality, but we're, we're dialing it in. It's getting yeah. one video at a time. It's getting slowly better. So I know which one you're talking about. The audio was really low. You have to reshoot that because it looks like a fast. <laughs> yeah, it's it's about the history of the spike tomahawk. So I want to, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Reshoot oh, that one. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> for my edification. Zach, thank you so much for, for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Thank you it's for been... having me. And, and Jim, thanks for uh, facilitating big time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's been a pleasure to talk about this stuff. I really like what you do. And uh, I think it's really unique in a in an environment where there's not so much unique. There's mm -hmm. there's some unique, but this is, this is off the charts. So thank thanks you. again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Have a great one. You too. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you've got questions or comments, call the 24-7 Knife Junkie listener line at 724-466-4487. So, uh, as I've mentioned before, this Empress Tomahawk actually looks like it belongs on the wall of historical weapons behind me. Um, it just kind of has a timeless look and feel. Uh, but anyway, check out Wingard Wearables, wingardwearables.com. Um, if you're interested in these kind of unique and, and interesting tools, uh, I, I have uh, my interest in them uh, keeps growing. And uh, I've shown my wife the uh, the quill and she's fascinated. And our anniversary is coming up. So who knows? Maybe there's a quill in both of our futures. We could have matching quills. 
It would be lovely. Anyway, uh, check us out again next week on uh, the Knife Junkie podcast for another great interview with some of these uh, luminaries of the business. And also be sure to check out our live stream Thursday Night Knives, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here on YouTube. And of course, my close-up videos and my uh, my endless bloviating on the uh, midweek supplemental. You got to check those out too. All right. Thank you so much for watching the Knife Junkie podcast. And for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.